This is the first of three chapters that covers the skeleton. And it is important that you listen to these audio lectures moving forward because um, you only have uh, these audio lectures to go by in order to prepare for tests. Now, um, I would advise printing off the review sheet, printing off the notes, following along on this PowerPoint and making notes wherever you need them. Um, I will be going over important information as we go forward. I'm not going to do um, a review like we normally do in class because I really want you to listen to these audio lectures. It's important that you pay attention to these, listen to these, and make notes accordingly to prepare your review sheet for the test. There will be essays and I will be going over the important concepts to include in those essays as we get to them. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, seven, I think it's seven essays that you will uh, that are possible for the test and I will choose three and make those part of the um, test that you will take online. First thing is um, we're going to focus on bone tissue and we're going to just have an overview of the skeletal system and talk about some of the functions of the skeleton. And all this is on your notes too so you can follow along with that. So functions of the skeleton, uh, the first one is support. It forms a framework that supports the body and also cradles the soft organs. If you really think about it, where would you be without a skeleton? You'd be a blob on the floor. So it's a very durable type of structure that supports and protects uh, vital organs too. And that's our next point, protection. So when you think about the body cavities that we talked about in chapter one, we said that the bones provide a case that surrounds really delicate organs like the brain, the spinal cord, the thoracic organs, part of the um, abdominal cavity with the pelvic girdle and the bottom part of the rib cage. So you've got um, protection of those vital structures. Movement. Muscles use bones as levers to move the body, different parts of the body, and move the body itself from place to place. Electrolyte balance. Bones store a lot of minerals. There's a lot of salts, and these salts make that concrete that make the bone really hard. So these salts are mainly calcium phosphate salts, but there's also some magnesium. You have phosphorus in there with the phosphate. So you do have a lot of electrolytes that are stored in the bones themselves. Um, acid base balance. The bone can be used by breaking down or absorbing some of these different electrolytes which are involved in acid base balance. It's a little bit early to talk about acid base balance, but um, by breaking down or putting together these salts, these salts can act as buffers to neutralize acids and bases. So don't worry about that too much because we'll be talking about that next semester. And, um, but that is one of the functions. And then we have this tissue, blood forming tissue that's called hematopoietic tissue. And it's found in the red marrow of the bones, which we'll talk about a little later. But that tissue makes up all your blood cells. All your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets all come from these areas inside the bone that have red marrow. So moving forward, we have 206 bones. And they're divided into two groups. So you have the axial skeleton which is composed of the skull, the rib cage, and the vertebral column. It makes up the long axis of the body. Um, the appendicular skeleton. This part of the skeleton includes the bones of the upper and lower limbs, so arms and legs, and the bones or girdles that attach to those particular limbs to the axial skeleton. So say for instance, with the arm, you have the collarbone, which is in the front, and the scapula in the back. And those two bones, although they appear to be on the trunk of the body, those are, that's the girdle. Okay, so they actually attach the arm to the rib cage, or they attach, attach it to the axial skeleton. So that's what I'm talking about there. And we'll discuss that a little bit as we a little bit more as we move on. Okay. All right. So they put bones in classification by their shape. 
Now, there's four broad classifications of bones, and I'm not going to expect you to be able to just pick a bone and put it in a certain category, but just generally speaking, so that when we talk about uh, composition, the structures on bones, mainly it's uh, flat bones versus long bones, but um, just a general categorical uh, arrangement of bones. So long bones. Long bones generally um, fall into arm and leg bones and, and fingers, fingers and toes, because they have the same structure. They got this really narrow shaft and then the ends are a little bit more enlarged. Um, wrist bones though, and these back part, your back of the foot, those bones are different. They're gonna go into the short bone category. So long bones, mainly arms and legs. Flat bones are confined mostly to the axial part of the skeleton, although not all axial skeletal bones are flat bones, but say skull bones, some of those are flat. The ribs are flat, the sternum is flat, so those have a different structure and the way they're put together um, and they look microscopically is different. Um, you also have short bones. Now short bones are found mainly in those bones that make up the back of the foot and those are um, called tarsals and we'll talk about those later. And then in the wrist you have little short bones that are called carpals. So those are short. Now there is one short bone that's a little bit unusual because it develops within a tendon and this bone is called a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bone. And that bone, an example of that one, is the patella. The patella is what we call a sesamoid bone. So you might want to write that down. I don't see it here on the notes, so you might want to just make a, a note on the side. And sesamoid is S-E-S-A-M-O-I-D. Patella is a sesamoid bone. Now, anything that they can't put into one of these three categories they kind of shove over here into the irregular bone category okay so vertebrae and possibly the sphenoid the ethmoid you know uh, those bones are kind of unusual in shape but what i really want you to focus on here long bone okay most of the uh, bones of the limbs arms and legs and flat bones associated with the ribs and the sternum and some of the bones of the skull, okay? And then short bones, just remember that sesamoid bone. That's really all you have to worry about going forward. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the structure of a long bone. And this is looking at the humerus, which is the upper bone of the arm. And it's not very humerus because there's a lot of landmarks that you're going to have to lear learn for the lab portion of this course, but that's Lauren's job. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about just the main structures of the long bone. Now, there's a central shaft and this central shaft is called the diaphysis. There's the word. Now, in anatomy, words that end in SIS, if they're pluralized, you change that to SES. So diaphyses, more than one diaphysis. Now at the ends, the ends of the bone that are a little bit more enlarged than the central shaft, those are called epiphyses. Again, SIS, pluralized, SES. So the one that's closer to the attachment point is called the proximal epiphysis because we know that proximal is defined as being closer to the point of attachment and distal further away from the point of attachment so distal would be closer to the elbow and proximal to the shoulder. Now bones have articular cartilage. We talked about this in class and we said that articular cartilage is hyaline and that's found at the ends of long bones. Remember that's where we said hyaline cartilage was found. So there's some down there, there's some up there. And you can see there's two types of bone by composition. See compact bone and spongy bone. Well compact bone looks solid. Okay, it looks like it's completely dense, no openings, but you get to the spongy bone, it's got little holes in it. Okay, so spongy bone is a lot more porous, compact is more dense and hard. Um, there's a covering on the bone and that covering is called the periosteum and we'll talk about that in more detail. You can see right here where it's kind of torn away a little bit 
and then where the epiphyses and the diaphysis comes together is called the epiphyseal line right there and you would also have one down here on this end um, there is a cavity in compact bone and that is called the medullary cavity and there's a periosteum this this tissue covering on the outside you also have it lining the bone on the inside and that's called the endosteum so the word periosteum peri means around so periosteum means the covering around the bone endo within that's the covering that lines the bone from within from inside so those are your main structures associated with the long bone We talked about that covering around the bone called the periosteum and there's actually two layers to the periosteum. The outermost layer is fibrous connective tissue and that's called the fibrous periosteum. And then inside under that, that is called the osteogenic layer. Now that layer is made up of these bone cells that are called osteoblasts and there's other ones that are called osteoclasts. Now the osteoblast and osteoclast work in opposition to each other. Osteoclasts, they're the builders. They build bone matrix and they keep the density of the bone in place. They lay down the, the collagen fibers and the calcium phosphate salts can deposit on those. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but they build bone matrix and the osteoclasts, they work against them. They break it down. So you've got this dynamic relationship between these two populations of cells that are constantly working together to maintain the bone's integrity. Now, during the course of your lifetime, you're constantly remodeling, rebuilding bone because of the activity of these bones and of bone cells. And you also have an endosteum that's on the inside. And this lining on the inner bone surfaces has the same two layers. It has a fibrous layer and an osteogenic layer. And so you have this dynamic relationship between these two populations of cells inside and out constantly breaking down and building and you know on average you replace about 10% of your skeleton a year. So it's not the type of structure that stays the same for your entire lifetime. It's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing. So I just want you to be aware of that. So make sure you know the periosteum, the two layers, and um, what's in that osteogenic layer, the osteoblast and the osteoclast and what their roles are and we will hit them again a little bit later. Now we talked about the structures of a long bone. We talked about the diaphysis, the marrow cavity, the epiphyses at the end, and this is flat bone. Now flat bone looks a little bit different because it looks like a sandwich. And if you look at this picture here, this is a bone of the skull, and you'll see here's the outside. This is your compact bone on the outside. And then on the inside, you have the spongy bone that we saw also in the long bone, but there's a name in flat bones for the spongy bone that you find there and it's called diploe. So I want you to really pay attention to that word because diploe is the name of the spongy bone that you find in flat bones. Now spongy bone is made up of a unit and this is something that you'll find on your review sheet, microscopic structures of spongy bone, that these units are called trabeculae. So spongy bone is made up of these little beams, B-E-A-M, not beans like canned beans, um, beams of bone that are linked together and they make this irregular pattern of, looks like a sponge, okay? So that's trabeculae. So you wanna remember that word here, trabeculae. That's what you call the individual units of spongy bone. Now when you look at the microscopic anatomy of bone, there are cells and we kind of mentioned the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts already, but it doesn't hurt to review things a little bit. But when you look at when you look at the osteogenic cells, these are like stem cells, okay? They develop from fibroblasts and they give rise to other bone cells. Um, these are cells that are like stem cells and every tissue just about has stem cells. So these are stem cells that can give rise to new uh, varieties, osteoblasts, osteocytes, osteoclasts, okay? 
Now your osteoblasts, we said, were the bone forming cells. And these are found in the endosteum and the periosteum. Now the osteocytes, these are mature bone cells and I'll show you in a minute where you find them. They used to be osteoblasts, but when bones remodeling are developing, these cells get trapped in lacunae. And remember that the lacunae are the little openings in tissue like cartilage and we also have it in bones, a characteristic of some connective tissue. So these guys are in prison trapped in lacunae. And then the osteoclast, these are the ones that break down bone matrix, the very large cells and um, they're found in the, in the periosteum and endosteum as well. Now, looking at the other components of the bone, so we talked about the cells. Now we have this non-living matrix. So you have the osteoids. So you've got your osteogenic cells, your osteoblasts, your osteocytes, your osteoblasts, and then you have the non-living matrix, okay? So that's one third of organic bone matrix that's secreted by the osteoblasts. So going back to what we talked about with non-living matrix, ground substance, and then it has some proteins in it and some sugars, proteoglycans are proteins plus sugar and glycoproteins are sugar plus proteins, um, but it's just biochemically, they're structured a little bit different. Don't worry too much about that. Um, and then you have collagen fibers. And the arrangement of this collagen fiber is really important because you're going to find that the salts, those calcium phosphate salts that we talked about earlier, they're going to deposit on the collagen fibers. But this network of fibers and that ground substance with your proteins in them and that ground substance makes this very thick and it contributes to the structure and provides the tensile strength and flexibility of the bone. So this is your non-living matrix, the organic part. Ground substance, proteins, collagen fibers, okay? And then we move forward to the part that is inorganic. These are your salts. Now they're collectively called hydroxyapatites. That's a name to remember, isn't it? Hydroxyapatites are mineral salts. So remember, one third is the organic part. That's your ground substance and your collagen fibers and proteins. And this one is 65%. This is your, these are your mineral salts, which is inorganic. Mainly calcium phosphate crystals in and around the collagen fibers. So these crystals actually make bone like concrete. They're responsible for the hardness and resistance to compression. So hydroxyapatites, calcium phosphate salts, these make up 65% of bone. Now, bone textures. We have compact and we have spongy bone. And a few slides ago, I showed you a picture and I said, see the long bone, how you have that kind of bone that's compact, it looks solid all the way through, and then spongy has a lot of holes. It's very porous looking. So these are the two different types by their appearance. Compact, very dense, solid, smooth, spongy, which is also called cancellous or trabecular bone. Looks like a honeycomb of flat pieces all put together and these flat little pieces are the little beams that we call trabeculae. So you want to remember spongy bone, also called cancellous or trabecular bone, made up of little beams of bone that link together, makes the bone look like a sponge, and those little beams are called trabeculae. This is going to give us a lot of information because it's showing you a piece of the diaphysis of a bone, and it's showing you um, the compact bone on the outside, and then on the inside, it's showing you some spongy bone. So let's go through this and look at some of the important features of this because some of these words are going to be important and they're going to be testable. And the first one, remember, I said spongy bone is made up of little units that are called trabeculae. Now, if you go to the compact bone, this is all compact bone here. Okay, and then spongy bone is in here on the inside. 
Now, the unit of compact bone, spongy bone is trabeculae, right? The unit for compact bone is called an osteon, and the older term is the Haversian system, but it means the same thing. And these osteons are made up of circular rings of bone that go around this opening that's called the central canal. And the central canal has a blood supply. There's an artery, there's a vein, there's a nerve, so bones have feeling. If you hit your shin, you really feel the pain, right? And bone has an extensive blood supply. So it does have arteries and veins that go through these central canals. Now these central canals run up and down the long axis of the bone, up and down like that. And since our blood supply is a complete closed system, what you need is you need some way to get the blood supply into the bone and also in between these central canals that are all running in the same direction. So you have these perforating or Volkmann's canals that run perpendicular to the long axis of the bone and they connect all the different central canals together. So you can see a few of them right there. Um, and there's some of your endosteum we talked about earlier. That's the same as the pericosteum, but it's on the inside, lining bony canals and covering the trabeculae. And you can see also that you have um, this connection that holds the periosteum to the surface of the bone. Now these are very short collagen fibers that are called perforating or Sharpies fibers. So those are the fibers that attach the periosteum to the surface of the bone. Actually, uh, just for an example of something, a way to really experience this, if you're cooking chicken at home and you've cooked chicken bone, and you had chicken and you had bones, after you've eaten the chicken, if you scrape your nail along the surface of the bone, you can actually peel that periosteum off. It's like tissue paper and it's kind of rips off. You can hear it rip off. It's very tightly attached to the surface of the bone. Um, there's your little rings that are associated with the osteon and these little rings of bone that go around the central canal, these are called lamellae. Lamellae are little plates of bone and these are um, in a circular orientation surrounding that central canal. Now here's your osteocytes that are embedded in their lacunae. And they communicate with each other, and they communicate with each other through these little canals that are called canaliculi. And people always tell me, if you remember, can I lick your eye? You'll never forget that word. So these are living cells, and that's their way of communicating with each other. So here's a picture over here. You see a picture of an actual osteon. Uh, your lamellae, your central canal, your lacunae, where your osteocytes are found. So it gives you a lot of information. Another picture here that shows you um, lacunae with osteocytes. And um, these things are constantly erupting. You're constantly re remodeling, rebuilding new bones. So you're constantly evolving new osteons. I want you to keep in mind that bone is a very dynamic structure. It's constantly being remade, broken down, rebuilt. This lamellae here, this is the lamellae that goes around the entire circumference of the bone itself. And this lamellae is actually laid down by the osteoblasts and osteoclasts that are in that inner layer, that osteogenic layer of the periosteum. So those are all your microscopic structures of compact bone. So you want to pay attention to compact bone, osteon, spongy bone, trabeculae, um, endosteum, covering on the inside, periosteum, the outside, Sharpie's fibers, attaching the periosteum to the surface of the bone, um, osteon being made up of the central canal containing nerves, blood vessels, um, the lamellae, the little plates of bone that go around the central canal, osteocytes in the lacunae, canaliculi are the little canals that help the osteocytes trapped in their um, in their lacunae to be able to communicate with each other. Okay, so now we're going to talk about different types of marrow. So we have red marrow and we have yellow marrow. 
So red marrow is what we call hematopoietic tissue because it produces red blood cells, it produces white blood cells, it produces your platelets. And this is found in primarily spongy bone and the diploe of the flat bones because this is where you have little openings where you can have other tissues inside of those openings. Now in the adult, long bones have very little red marrow. Um, usually the red marrow is confined to the axial portion of the skeleton and then the heads of the femur and the humerus only. In children, just about every bone of the body has red marrow in it. And as we age and we grow up and we reach adulthood, eventually um, that red marrow is replaced in your long bones is replaced by yellow marrow. So yellow marrow is fat filled medullary cavities and in adults all long bones have yellow marrow. So that's the difference between your types of marrow. Now bone development. This is a process of bone tissue formation. It starts usually at the end of the second month, um, usually at the end of embry the embryonic period. And it continues on until you're born. And then after you're born, you have postnatal bone growth until early adulthood. And then bone remodeling and repair, remember, is a lifetime process. So you're constantly remodeling, repairing, rebuilding bone. And it's around 10% per year on average. So in around 10 years, you have almost a new skeleton again. So this is a little involved. But we'll go through it. Um, this is talking about intramembranous ossification. And this is primarily what occurs in flat bones. So it starts off with mesenchyme tissue. Now mesenchyme, remember, comes from that mesoderm layer. Remember the inner layer of the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Well, mesoderm gives rise to connective tissue and bone is a connective tissue. So that mesoderm converts into mesenchyme, they call it. And the mesenchymal cells, those are the cells that are gonna give rise to your mesenchyme tissue, all right? That's early on. So what happens is there's an ossification center that appears in the fibrous connective tissue membrane. And this happens because selected centrally located mesenchymal cells, they cluster together and they differentiate into osteoblasts. So there's a signal that occurs. All this happens is predetermined where certain genes are turned on and they change these cells into something different. And this forms an ossification center that produces the first trabeculate of spongy bone. Now I want you to remember, this is very complex, but when you think about it, you start off as a fertilized egg, one cell. Out of that one cell, something has to happen as that thing multiplies and divides to make those cells turn into other cells because eventually once you reach adulthood, that one cell becomes many trillions of cells and there's over 200 different kinds. So turning on genes and changing cells from one type of cell to another is common, very common in early development. And here's an example of it here. These mesenchymal cells differentiate into osteoblasts. And remember that the osteoblasts are the ones that lay down the bone matrix. So here they're starting to spit out some osteoid. Okay, so they're starting to lay down the ground substance and they radiate out from each other and they continue to build this osteoid and make what's called an ossification center. And eventually this osteoid starts to fill the space and it's secreted within this fibrous membrane and it starts to calcify. Osteoblasts secrete the osteoid and it calcifies in a few days. There's your osteoblast. There's the osteoid, there's the newly calcified uh, bone matrix. There's your osteocytes that get caught up in, the, in their lacunae and they become trapped there. So the trapped osteoblast becomes osteocytes. And then eventually you get this woven network. It's an irregular network of bone formation. So the accumulating osteoid is laid down 
between embryonic blood vessels in a matter that results in a network. So instead of having concentric lamellae that you'd have in compact bone, you have this pattern of little beams called trabeculae, and this forms a, it's kind of a weave, it's a woven bone. And then vascularized mesenchyme, so you have blood vessels that come in and they invaginate into the open spaces. This uh, mesoderm condenses on the external face of the woven bone, and actually this softer tissue is going to become the periosteum. Isn't that interesting? So eventually as time goes on, lamellar bone replaces woven bone right here. That's what's going to become compact bone, just inside the periosteum. And then red marrow is going to occur in here. Trabeculae, just deep to the periosteum, they thicken. And then you get the plates. Mature lamellar bone replaces them, forming compact bone plates. And remember the structure of flat bones. You have the marrow in the middle. Uh, marrow cavity, that's your diploe, because that's spongy bone with your compact bone on either side, looks like a sandwich. Spongy bone diploe, consisting of distinct trabeculae, persists internally and its vascular tissue becomes the red marrow. So there's your diploe, there's your plate of compact bone, these are your osteoblasts laying down the matrix, there's the fibrous portion of your periosteum on the outside. So that's how intramembranous ossification occurs. Endochondral ossification begins at around the same time. Now this is what happens with long bones. Now long bones start off as hyaline cartilage and you can see the little bar of hyaline cartilage over there at the left. So what starts as cartilage starts to transition into your primary ossification center just like we had um, with your mesenchymal intramembranous ossification. A bone collar forms around the diaphysis here. Those are osteoblasts that are laying this down. And as this bone collar forms and your ossification center starts to um, take off, then you end up with an area of deteriorated cartilage matrix. And that cartilage center, um, as cartilage in the center of the di diaphysis starts to calcify and then develops and then develops cavities. So spongy bone formation begins. There is a blood vessel that invades and brings in your stem cells that are going to seed those marrow cavities with the stem cells to provide cells for blood cell formation. Um, and as you have one ossification center here in the middle, but you also have ossification centers that are going to occur in the diaphyses. So there's a secondary ossification center there and there. So the diaphysis starts to elongate and the medullary cavity forms. Secondary ossification center appears in the epiphyses. And at the very end, the epiphyses ossify. When completed, the only place you have hyaline cartilage is in the epiphyseal plate, which we call the growth plate, and then um, the articulating cartilages at the end of the bone. And this is the way long bones actually will start. And from childhood to adolescence, you get more growth at the epiphyseal plate there. So that's the development of endochondral, through endochondral ossification, what happens with long bones. It starts with hyaline cartilage, um, but it gives you an idea of the difference, like we saw before with uh, mesenchymal, which is flat bones and how they develop, and then endochondral in long bones. So growth in long bones um, continues through childhood. And near the end of adolescence, these chondroblasts that you find in the metaphysis, which is in the epiphyseal plate, they slow down and they divide less, less often. But the ossification that's occurring in the diaphysis and the epiphyses, 
they are still going at the same rate of speed and actually they end up overtaking this epiphyseal plate area and eventually they will meet up and seal off the epiphyseal plate when growth ends and replace it with what's called the epiphyseal line and that is the remnant of the growth plate. So this is called epiphyseal plate closure. Bone lengthening ceases and the bone of the epiphysis and the diaphysis fuses. And in females, this occurs about 18 years of age. And in males, it occurs about 21 years of age. Now there's types of growth. There's interstitial growth that happens from the inside. So when we talk about the osteocytes being trapped in their lacunae, um, that's interstitial growth. From the outside, that's the osteogenic layer where you have the osteoblast and the osteoclast. So that's oppositional, oppositional growth. So interstitial inside, oppositional from the outside. And remember, bone is constantly remodeled. 10% of the skeleton is replaced every year due to this process. Now, because bones are constantly growing and remodeling in response to uh, changes and, and deposition, we're replacing 10% per year, there's another thing, and it's called Wolf's Law. And Wolf's Law says that bones tend to grow or remodel in response to stresses or demands placed upon it. So, if you exercise or you increase the demands on a bone, they're going to remodel themselves to be stronger and brace themselves for particular types of impact. And if you use, if you use a limb more or you lift weights um, or if you're left-handed or right-handed and you lose, use that particular hand a lot more, um, it's going to result in thicker and stronger bones in that particular, that particular arm. Curved bones are thickest where they're most likely to buckle. Um, so trabeculae form trusses along lines of stress. They form braces to resist um, the stresses put upon them so they don't break. Large bony projections occur where heavy active muscles attach. So any of the rough areas on the bone or the processes that stick off the surface of a bone, these are where muscles attach and you have muscles pulling at these bones. So having these rough areas helps them to be able to attach better. And if you really think about it, bones of the fetus and bedridden uh, individuals over time, those bony projections and rough areas will kind of erode away through bone remodeling and they become featureless. So it's an interesting point um, about the stresses really impact how the bones are going to look and how dense and thick they are. And Wolf's Law, remember, bones grow and remodel in response to demands placed upon them. If you don't use it, you lose it. So mineral deposition, you want to remember what these, word means, what these words mean. Deposition means you're building bone matrix, you're depositing bone. Resorption means you're breaking it down, okay? Now, ectopic calcification ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that occurs where it shouldn't belong, right? So ectopic calcification means this is calcifying of tissues that's happening where it shouldn't be happening. And it can happen in soft tissues. You've heard of hardening of the arteries. You've heard of cal um, calcium uh, deposits forming in soft tissues like cartilage and it makes your uh, joints crack and crunch and all that if you've had injuries. And even as you age, those tissues um, harden and are not quite as soft as they used to be. So that happens and sometimes it's part of normal aging. Doesn't normally happen all over the body, but um, just, you know, as, as we age. Now mineral resorption, this is dissolving bones and that's the osteo, osteoclast. Now, how this happens is these osteoclasts are very big cells. They're over 150 microns in diameter, which is, which is very large in comparison to a skin cell it's about, that you saw under the microscope. Those uh, cheek cells you saw, these are about three times as big. And what they do is they secrete hydrogen ions into extracellular fluid. Now hydrogen combined with chloride ions is hydrochloric acid. So 
it makes this acid that's er that erodes away the calcium phosphate salts. And then to add insult to injury, the osteoblasts release this acid phosphatase, and that breaks down the collagen fibers. So you've lost your solid calcium phosphate salts, then you've eroded away the collagen network of fibers that these salts deposit in and around, and you're left with nothing but open holes. So this can happen with osteoporosis. So demineralization, you don't want to occur um, to be over excessive because then this can cause you problems. So calcium. Calcium is really important. Calcium has many functions. We haven't talked about a lot of this yet, but we will as we go along. But it's important in nerve impulse transmission. It is critical for muscle contraction. It's involved with blood coagulation and secretion by glands and nerve cells. So important functions. I'm not going to go into them in detail now because we will hit them. Uh, nerve, conduct, nerve impulse transmission and muscle contraction within a few chapters here. Now you have about 1,200 to 1,400 grams of calcium in the body, which equates to a little over three pounds because there's 454 grams in a pound. 99% of this calcium is tied up in bones. And the amount of, bone, amount of calcium that's found in the blood is tightly regulated between 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. Now a deciliter is a tenth of a liter and a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. And remember that a gram is the weight of a little tiny metal paper clip. So just to give you some um, landmarks there to go by. And in order to absorb it through the intestinal wall, you need vitamin D metabolites to be able to absorb the calcium. And dietary intake is required. So you have to make sure you get enough calcium in your, in your diet to regulate the calcium that's in the bloodstream. And here's what happens. If you don't take in enough calcium, how the body will keep that in, keep that level normal is by breaking down bone matrix and releasing calcium into the bloodstream so that blood levels are kept normal. So it can be very dangerous not to get enough calcium in the diet because it could predispose you over time to osteoporosis. So you want to be sure that you get enough. Now there are hormones that regulate the level of calcium in the bloodstream and those two hormones are called parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Now parathyroid hormone is produced by the parathyroid glands. These glands are located behind the thyroid on the anterior surface of the neck around uh, the area of the larynx, right below the larynx. And what they do, what this hormone does, is it removes calcium from the bone regardless of bone integrity. Now calcitonin uh, may be involved and it does the opposite effect. It's produced by cells that are in the thyroid gland, these are called parafollicular cells, and they increase the intake of calcium into the bones. So here's what you want to remember. Calcitonin puts calcium into bones. Parathyroid hormone takes calcium out of the bones. So parathyroid hormone will increase blood levels of calcium and calcitonin decreases blood levels of calcium. Right? So you want to keep those two straight because that's really, really important. So if you have something called hypocalcemia, blood calcium deficiency, this can lead to muscle tremors, spasms, uh, contractures, tetanus, carpal pedal spasms where your hands and feet draw up and this is indicative of hypocalcemia. Hypercalcemia, blood calcium excess can cause depression of the nervous system and possible cardiac arrest. This, this is quite rare. Usually your problem is having too little calcium. So that's what you want to really pay attention to. So here's what happens with this negative feedback hormonal loop for calcium homeostasis. And basically controlled by the parathyroid hormone. When blood calcium levels are low, parathyroid hormone is released. 
and parathyroid hormone stimulates the osteoclast to break down bone matrix, releasing calcium, and that calcium going into the bloodstream will raise blood calcium levels to the normal level, and then that shuts off the negative feedback system so that your parathyroid hormone um, production ends. So it's a negative feedback system. So if you don't take in enough calcium, you're continually breaking down bone matrix and over time can lead you to brittle bone syndrome, osteoporosis, any of these things. So improper dieting, anorexia, bulimia, practices that you see people participate in not realizing the long-term effect that could happen to them by not getting proper nutrition. And um, PTH is really the one that can cause you major problems. Other hormones that are of importance uh, during bone growth. Growth hormone is the most important hormone during the formative years, infancy and childhood, stimulating the epiphyseal plate to make long bones increase in size, elongate, very important hormone. Now there's two types of dwarfism, which I think is really interesting, um, that I'm going to talk about. And the one that occurs because of a lack of growth hormone is called pituitary dwarfism, because that's where growth hormone comes from, is the pituitary gland. And dwarfism that occurs because of a lack of growth hormone, these individuals are small, but everything's in proportion. Okay. So that's one, one type of dwarfism. Now look down here at thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone modulates activity of growth hormone, ensures proper proportions. So if a person is deficient in thyroid hormone while they're developing, they develop a type of dwarfism where the axial part of the body is kind of normal in, in size. The head, the trunk area is normal, but the limbs are short. So this is called cretinism, C-R-E-T-I-N-I-S-M. So this is um, a type of dwarfism caused by a deficiency in thyroid hormone. Growth hormone, that's pituitary dwarfism. They're just small, but everything's in proportion. Uh, just an application there. Testosterone is in males and estrogen in females. These are the ones that account for the adolescent growth spurts and end growth by inducing epiphyseal plate closure. And as with most things, excesses and deficits of any can cause abnormal skeletal growth. Okay, so we will um, move on to bone fractures, um, bone breaks, and then we'll talk a little bit about bone repair and finish up this chapter. So, there are four different types of class, uh, fracture classifications. The first one is by the position of the bone ends after the fracture. If the bones remain in place, that's non-displaced. The bones, the ends retain their normal position. If it's displaced, the ends are out of normal alignment. Um, then there's completeness of the break. If it's complete, the bone's broken all the way through. If it's incomplete, the bone's not broken all the way through. Orientation of the break. Linear, parallel to the long axis of the bone, transverse, perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. And then you have um, these more complicated type of fractures where um, the skin is penetrated or not. Open, compound, the skin is penetrated. Uh, it's closed, simple, skin is not penetrated. These are some other types of common fractures that have names comminuted bone fragments into many pieces. Particular, uh, particularly, you'll find this in um, the aged, whose bones are more brittle and tend to really shatter into pieces um, when you do have some type of a break. Compression, the bone is crushed. Um, this happens a lot when you have bone that's compromised due to osteoporosis and very weakened. So you see it like in the vertebral column causing hunchback in people that have osteoporosis. They call that kyphosis. Also extreme trauma as in a fall, you can have the vertebrae crush in that case too. Spiral 
um, is a ragged break that occurs when excessive twisting forces are applied to a bone. I think of sp um, sports activities where people wear cleats and the cleats get stuck in the ground and then somebody takes the individual and spins them around. Um, so you'll get that type of, of fracture displayed there. Um, epiphyseal, this is where you have a break in the um, epiphyseal plate. Um, it is a little bit uh, easier to break there in children. Softer tissue and the, epi the epiphysis can separate from the diaphysis along the epiphyseal plate. Um, and sometimes it can affect the growth in that bone. So you have to be careful to follow up uh, with these types of injuries to make sure it doesn't impact the growth during uh, those years when those bones are changing. Depressed, broken bone portion is pressed inward, typical of a skull fracture. Green stick, the bone breaks in completely. It kind of uh, bends on one side and then breaks on the other. And it's more common in children where the bones are a little bit more flexible than those of adults. Now this is what's involved during um, the, the stages of healing of a bone fracture. And the first thing that happens is when you break a bone, it bleeds. So these blood vessels will hemorrhage and then you get a mass of clotted blood, which is called a hematoma, and that forms at the fracture site. And the site's going to become swollen, it's going to be painful, and it's going to become inflamed. And then a few days later, you'll form this granulation tissue. And the granulation tissue is just a soft, fibrous mass. And then a few more days after that, fibroblasts will start to deposit collagen fibers in the granulation tissue, while some of the osteogenic cells become chondroblasts and produce patches of fibrocartilage. So between the two populations of cells, they produce this um, fibrous cartilage type of mass that's called the soft callus. And then the next step is the conversion to the bony callus, where you have other osteogenic cells they become osteoblast and they're going to lay down the bone matrix. So they're going to make the calcified bone that's called the hard callus. Now the hard callus only acts as a splint to hold the bones together and it usually forms about three to four weeks after injury, but it's really not weight bearing at that point. So you really shouldn't take a cast off after three to four weeks if it's a weight bearing bone because um, this can break again very easily. But it takes another two months or so for the bone to actually be strong enough, especially with weight bearing bones, you have to be very careful. So at the end, remodeling occurs and the excess material on the bone shaft exterior and the medullary canal is removed and then compact bone is laid down to reconstruct the shaft walls. So these are the four, four steps of healing of a bone fracture. It's one of your essay questions. So what you should do is list the four steps and explain what's taking place during those four steps in order to get credit for this essay. So fracture treatment and repair. Treatment, the term is reduction and reduction is realignment of the broken bone ends. Closed reduction is where a physician manipulates the bones into the correct position and it doesn't require any surgery. If the bones cannot be put in the correct position without surgery, then that's called open reduction, where you have to put in some pins, some wires, some plates, some screws, and, and put the bones back into place and let them heal after you've added a little bit of hardware. Sometimes you need to immobilize by casts or traction for healing. It depends on the break severity, the bones broken, and also the age of the patient. So we'll talk about bone disorders just a little bit. I'm going to uh, talk about osteoporosis, and it's, osteoporosis is really a group of diseases, 
and it's where your bone breakdown or resorption outpaces bone deposition because remember you have these osteoblasts and osteoclasts and they're working against each other and you want to make sure that the osteoclasts aren't winning that war. Spongy bone of the spine and neck of the femur are the most susceptible so vertebral and hip fractions are very fractures are very common um, because those are bones that withstand an awful lot of stress. So this is looking at a contrast between um, normal bone and sponge osteoporotic bones. You can see here how dense the bones trabeculate looks and you have your openings but down here look at how porous the trabeculae are and in some places it looks like almost open space there's really nothing there. Um, so that's Treating osteoporosis, traditional treatments, calcium, vitamin D supplements, weight-bearing exercise, um, hormone replacement therapy, you want to really think about HRT, look at your family history and make sure that doing that type of therapy would not make you more susceptible to certain types of cancer. It slows bone loss, but it does not reverse it. And it's very controversial due to increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer. Um, there are estrogenic compounds that are supplements. They're vegetable-based uh, substitutes. Estroven is one that I'm aware of. Um, there are medications out there, Fosamax, which helps with osteoporosis. Um, but a lot of different um, theories out there. And this, is, again, is another essay question. So ideas for answers to that question on how to treat a person with osteoporosis.